Hi everyone, my name is Frank Lloyd and in celebration of my latest recording No Limits I've put together a few short tutorial videos explaining some of the various advanced techniques and concepts I use in my practice and preparation of the pieces in this recording. As you will hear on the recording there's a lot of fun and highly technical passages in No Limits but as you will undoubtedly be aware as horn players yourselves there has been a lot of serious hard work and thought gone into the preparation of this recording. Things that in the end help in making the difficult passages sound light and easy. Just like the album title suggests, these are pieces played on the very limits of what our instrument can do. And this could cause problems for those of you wishing to work at these pieces if you approach them the wrong way. To help you enjoy these pieces more, I'm going to explain a few technical aspects in order to help you get the most out of your own technique and to help you push your own limits on the horn. First off, I'd like to talk to you about fast finger coordination and multiple tonguing techniques. When it comes to playing fast on the horn, we have to admit that we're already at a bit of a disadvantage compared with our friends and colleagues on the trumpets, cornets and euphoniums. For the simple fact that our rotary valves, in most instances, our rotary valves are always going to be less efficient than the piston valves of the cornets and trumpets and euphoniums. That's a simple fact because of the technique involved and the uh, mechanic involved in an indirect uh, connection with the valves on the rotary valves and the more direct simply pressing the valves on the, uh, on the piston valves. So that just means basically we've got to work in the end a little bit harder and in the longer passages our fingers will get tired quicker. When approaching playing fast there's three basic concepts I think about. First of all it's going to be airflow. Efficient airflow. The tongue can only really work efficiently articulating that airflow and that airstream, so that's important. In fast passages, you've always got, also got to think of coordination. So we've got airflow and coordination. And together with these two, we need efficiency. Efficiency not only of the airflow, efficient with the coordination, but efficiency and also working out the best and most advantageous fingerings of these pieces. We might be used to certain fingerings in our everyday playing, but these fingerings might not, might not be uh, as, as good and as efficient as other fingerings when it comes to playing fast. We want to, in most instances, avoid second and third fingers as much as possible. And there are certain finger combinations which are inherently slower than others. For instance, try playing very fast between uh, a B natural and a B flat on a B flat horn or F sharp and F natural. This particular valve combination is going to be slow. It's the taking up of one finger in the same time depressing another. That's a lot of work and that's going to slow us down if we do a lot of this in a particular phrase. So I try and limit that to one iteration already by the second iteration it's going to be getting slower. Another um, inefficient fingering is going to be between one and two and two and three where we have the same problem of lifting a finger and depressing another. So that's going to be a slower fingering. So when it comes to thinking and working on these pieces, it's getting the most efficient fingering, which is going to enable you to play fast and clean so that every note speaks. This coordination and airflow is going to be necessary for the simple fact that these notes, the fast 16th notes, are only in existence for 10th, 12th of a second and they need to have good airflow and air pressure behind so for that one instance they speak cleanly and fully otherwise we will not hear a complete sequence of notes in the phrase. When I was working at the 
flight of the bumblebee. I was working at several different fingerings and I opted for the F on in the middle of the instrument for the simple fact it gave me a nice flowy, flowing fingering for this particular phrase. And although I used the second and third fingers in this particular phrase, you can actually avoid the second and third fingers in that you use the first valve, seventh harmonic, which simplifies it somewhat. And although the A flat in this particular instrument is going to be flat, in a fast passage it's not going to be so noticeable. So let's compare this one now and um, playing the seventh harmonic with a first valve rather than using second and third. So the difference is going to be between or and you will admit that it's much easier with the first valve rather than using that, uh, that second and third valve. And the reason I chose this fingering was also going to help me in the next phrase, which is um, an exact echo of this particular phrase, a fourth higher. So I can use exactly the same fingerings on the B flat horn. So from here, I used exactly the same fingering on the B flat horn. And again, you could simplify it by playing the D flat on the first valve. And it's hardly noticeable. The very the slight flatness of the D flat is going to be hardly noticeable. So you can make life a little bit more easier for yourself. Um, unfortunately, there's some phrases in this where you're going to have to use the, uh, the second and third valves, especially when you get down to the G, um, the middle G down here. And that's really very important when we're going to be playing on the F horn. You haven't really got a chance to, to play between the B flat and F horn in this instance. You would be just adding more work and it would become inefficient. You couldn't imagine playing that fast changing to the B-flat horn for the A-flat. To do that at speed would be practically impossible. So you have to stay on the A-flat horn. That means we've got quite a lot of change of length of tubing when we go from the G, which is open, to the A-flat, which is two and three. So that's where our good air flow and good air pressure helps in getting that note to sound. If we haven't got enough pressure, it's not going to change, it's not going to enable us to get the amount of air through this suddenly longer tubing to get up this end. So it's going to sound slightly muffled and not as clean. So we need to... We've got to put a little bit more effort into that particular phrase so we get sounding all of the notes. Otherwise it's going to sound not very clean. So in the upper octave we could again use that first valve trick in that we avoid our second and third finger. And we could play just about as fast as uh, fast as we need to, faster than we would need to with this particular thing because it's a particularly easier fingering. Not quite so easy with the second and third Although that's the way I did it because that's the way I was used to playing. Another thing is, is uh, when we practice, we're getting our fingers to memorize this. When it gets so fast, it's very difficult to actually read every single note. And our practice serves the purpose that we get this muscle memory. And although we're looking at shapes and we're looking at where we are in the music, we're not necessarily reading every single note. We just have to have it, what we say, in our fingers. And this was evident when it came to playing the Rossini on the recording. I had learned that before and played it on my very first recording over 20 years ago. And I fingered on a B-flat horn in, uh, in our very difficult key of B major. I have the option. We all have the option. Those of us that play Engelbert Schmidt horns, 
in to tune the instrument either into E, a semitone lower, or into B natural um, by moving slides. This would mean that the Rossini, rather than having to play it in B major with all the sharps and the difficulties that that, that entails, you could play it in fingering in E flat. It makes it very much easier. Or if I pulled the valves, if I pulled it out and down a semitone, then I would need to just finger in F. I had always played this in fingering it in B major. So to suddenly change it to an albeit easier fingering was out of the question for the simple fact that my muscle memory had played it one way and to change it into a completely different fingering would have been much too much work and it would have meant relearning the whole piece. So actually I was happier playing rather than fingering on the easier B flat horn, just because it was already in the fingers. Now, that's just touching on a little of how we get the most efficient and the best results when we're slurring. Good airflow, very good coordination, making sure that we've got good, efficient fingers that help us as much as possible and that we're not using unnecessarily awkward fingerings, which are going to make things more difficult. Now, when it comes to tonguing, we've really got this coordination problem. Is tonguing at exactly the right moment when the finger is completely depressed? And, and that, as you can imagine, is going to get more difficult the faster we get. Let's start initially by working at our actual articulation, primarily double and triple tonguing. Now I started double and triple tonguing before I'd even started single tonguing. I remember the very first days I went into my brass band uh, on the trombone and everyone was like showing off and trying to do double and triple tonguing and it was like, wow, I've got to be able to do this. So I'd started learning this very early on to help with my practice to get the clarity with speed, especially of the weak syllable, which is going to be the ka, what I do is to put the ka on to the first beat of the bar and play a dotted rhythm, which puts the tka, 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 tka on that downbeat, which helps strengthen it because when it gets fast, they've got to sound absolutely even. So the exercise would be this. <laughs> Taka, taka. In that way, you're putting the weak syllable on the one, which helps get it stronger, which we're going to need later. Next stage, we'll be bringing it back the ta again, the first syllable. Taka ta, taka ta. That comes onto the one, and we try always to assure that they're both, they're all three sounding the same with the same clarity. <laughs> It's good to start primarily on one note because then you don't have to think about any technical elements. As that becomes easier, then we can incorporate that into scales and other passages. Um, a very good tutor, by the way, would be the Arvind tutor, which uh, gives many exercising, all different technical exercises with double and triple tonguing to help your fingering. And especially in these pieces, a lot of these pieces actually come from the Arban tutor themselves. So they've got a, it's a very good uh, cornet school, which we can also use to help our um, technique at this level. Once it's working on one note, then we can incorporate into that, into scales. And <laughs> And from there, the sky's the limit, or at least the studies and the solo pieces towards the back of the Arvin Tutor, which are the ones we're particularly talking about. Now, when approaching triple tonguing, it's the same concept, in that I put the ka syllable on the one, the tada is the first half of the triplet, that's a flick of the tongue 
ta da so behind the teeth and then against the gum ta da and then the ka and, and during the ka the tongue is going to return to the front position so you're ready for the next ta so to start we start with the first two syllables <laughs> Just like going ta-da, 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 ta-da. That's a little flick of the tongue that gives our first two syllables. So we're not actually repeating one particular syllable, which gives makes the tongue work harder. We've got a little flick of the tongue, and that gives us these ta-da. Then we've got the ka, so we put the ka on the beat. the same way once we get it working nicely and one simple note in the middle of the horn we can then incorporate that into our scales and the uh, the studies um, to help build and speed up our coordination then we come full circle with the tar again so we get and then basically just like in the double tonguing we continue that figure. Practice is getting it absolutely smooth and again, efficient, working with that airflow. Don't forget it's the tongue working in coordination with that airstream, which is very important. The airstream is always going to be most important, like a long note. Ta with the ah opening the palate at the back, so we've got good, efficient air arriving here. And the tongue is working in coordination with that airstream, articulating that airstream, and, and the airstream in itself helping the tongue bounce. So it's very efficient very efficient movement, movement of air and the movement of the tongue working together. It keeps us nice and clean and sounding lots of clarity and we hear all of the notes. It's so easy to get muddy and unclear when we're playing fast and that's what we're trying to avoid, to get the efficiency and, and clarity in our fast playing. So the likes of the double tonguing, that's going to help you in passages, you're going to need it in passages like in the um, in the Arban, in the Carnival of Venice, for instance, um, when we've got things like when we've really got to have very good coordination and lots of articulation to make it sound very clean when it gets fast. Um, in the triple tonguing, also, we've got options of fingerings, like in the Tyrolean, for instance. I've got the option in this particular phrase, in the last variation, playing this figure either no fingering on the air horn, all open notes, or fingering it on the B-flat horn, now I've got the dilemma. It's easier in one way on the F horn because there's no fingers, but I've got the added difficulty of getting the clarity on the longer F horn, which is going to be more difficult than getting the clarity on the B flat horn. Now on the B flat horn, I've got the clarity, easier clarity because of the shorter instrument, but I've got the fingerings. So that's a choice I have to make. If the fingers work fine and I get obviously the the necessary coordination, then it's going to be nice and clean, and maybe I'll opt for the B flat horn. See, not quite clean enough. B F horn, let's try. So, in this way, practicing both alternatives, which way is it going to run the smoothest and going to be the most efficient? Then I cheat a little. Because in the next phrase, <clears throat> I don't triple. I do a retake. Ta 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 dum. Because I've got a sixth to jump down. And to do that, ta -da, very quickly, it's less clear than when I use ta 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 dum. 
So I start again with the tucker. Again, helping with the clarity and making sure I get all of the notes and not just most of them. So these are just some tips to help you get the best out of your technique and how to approach multiple tonguing, getting your double tonguing sounding nice and clean and even triple tonguing exactly the same and then working gradually in more technical aspects and, um, and you'll find in a, in a short time, a short period of time, that uh, your technique will improve and you'll get much more enjoyment and have much more fun uh, tackling these pieces and uh, that's why I do it and that's why I've been doing it for years. So I hope you enjoy them and I hope that you get uh, a lot of fun in your own practice because that's very important. Well, that just about concludes it for this video. I hope I've been able to give you a little more insight into these particular elements of playing and I'm sure that with diligent practice your own technical skills will improve and add to your own enjoyment of playing the horn. Please be sure to like and send this video to your friends and if you'd like to find out where you can purchase No Limits please go to the links provided in the text just below this video. I'm Frank Lloyd and until next time bye for now.